Um, I'm Justin Rosniak, and I tweeted about housing policy. Yeah, that was your... That this is going to be your downfall. Exactly. And, uh, hello, all the worst people on Twitter. <laughs> I, we might not know what we're talking about, but I can promise you Matt fucking Iglesias doesn't either. I, I worked in a public housing uh, uh, authority. No, it doesn't, it checks, doesn't count because the you didn't get details said nobody cares about. housing and urban development on them, or the one check did. Doesn't matter. I didn't get any more because I had direct deposit, right? So yeah, no, it doesn't matter. No, it doesn't matter. Knowledge of housing policy right. weakens the body, clouds the mind, corrodes the soul. Right? Yes. Yes. And the thing is, I said Matt Iglesias was wrong about the ability of the federal government to just ignore zoning law, which I now know to be technically wrong, but which I believe is morally right. Yeah. Because. Well, you know, okay, reality warps itself around Matty, Matt Iglesias' statements, right? Uh, if Matty said the ocean was blue, we'd immediately revert to a pre-Homeric conception of color and start referring to the wine-dark sea, right? Um, <laughs> but this is my theory. I will defend my statement. The federal government can just build public housing, right? And I know that, like, okay... Public housing authorities are apparently locally controlled, though they use federal money. But the thing is, they use federal money. And the other thing is, the federal government can just do what it wants, right? It can do anything it fucking wants to. We, the ATF building in Washington, D.C., like, they had a nice new zoning code there, and they were like, uh, you know, all right, fuck you. What we want is a 50-foot setback, and we also want, like, blast barriers, and we want, like all kinds of garbage and they got it right the embassy in london they said look we know you have all these regulations they said to another government we know you have all these regulations we want you know a hundred foot setback we want a blast wall and the city uh, and london was like ah, no nah, no nah, you can't do that and then they were like yeah we also want a moat <laughs> yeah and now we have a moat and you know you know what happened they managed to talk them down to half a moat right <laughs> And, like, the federal government can just do whatever it wants to the built environment. Like, the federal government radically altered the built environment of Atlanta under General William Tecumseh Sherman, and he never asked for a permit. <coughs> the Fed a, can yes. just do shit. <laughs> I don't know why I, there's, like, 20 hours of dunks on here on Twitter using acronyms I don't understand. This is bizarre. All right, that's my rant. I'm done. Uh, as with Alice's... Uh, tweet of which we do not make reference to a few years ago or a few months ago uh we we regret to inform you that we are forced to agree with Roz. <laughs> also i'm not fucking taking like dunks from a guy who literally earnestly believes that different countries have different safety rules and that's okay i'm simply not i'm sorry like that's a disqualifying fucking statement to me so I know Uday is is now just here for the ride. Sorry, bud. Uh, <laughs> but I, I want to absolutely go on record as saying when the worst people I know and when the worst people I know are all agreeing with Matt Iglesias, maybe we're doing something right. <laughs> also, I regret to inform you that I am going to go ahead and make a Roz Stinks. Well, there's your problem t-shirt that will be misspelled. We will absolutely. The, the day we get t shirts is. DIY merch. Yeah. Um, sorry about it disappearing for the first, like, four minutes of this. And it's also, uh, because I won't have the, um, the Zencaster file, Raj, you're going to have to edit out or mute the first, like, four and a half minutes of me swearing at nothing. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That's how I do a lot of editing on this show. <laughs> All right. You can tell because of the production values. Yes, oh, Roz. I you as it turns out, you can get Montreche yeast online. So I will be making Anger Juice, the official beverage of. Well, there's your problem. Fine. I thought it was the W T Y P I P A. <laughs> Shout out to that guy. Yeah, uh, he made a beer that I absolutely want to try. So yeah, I was hmm. about to say, s send us beer. We like beer. Okay. So anyway, now that I've ranted about. The concept of housing policy, which I believe should not exist. I can't believe I missed that. <laughs> I, I, you know, I think in a more, in, in a better world, 
like housing policy would just be locked in a dungeon that you would need like <laughs> like just just like a set of like 73 keys to get into and then at the bottom there would be there would be just a a a a, a series of dusty tomes you know in like hazmat bags <laughs> they all just say like build house yes do not eat <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, we're now now we're here. Enough of that bullshit. Uh, Let's enough talk of that about bullshit. the goddamn news. Um, okay, so we need to talk about what we're talking about today. Well, we need to first do introductions. Hi, I'm Justin Rosniak. I'm the person who's talking right now. Hi, I'm Alice Corval Kelly. I'm the person who is talking right now, unless her internet cuts out again. Uh, she and her, by the way. Uh, hi, I am Liam Anderson. Pronouns are he, him. Uh, shout out to those in the YouTube comment section for getting your shit under control this week. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> it's only been two days. And we have a guest. Yeah, we have a guest. Yeah. Hello, guest. Hello. I'm Uday Schultz. Um, I am the guest. I take he and him pronouns. Tell Sorry. us about yourself, Uday. Why are you here? Why no, the fuck don't. Are you it's a trap. Program? What are you, a cop? <laughs> <laughs> well, I like trains, uh, and I tweet about them. Oh. <laughs> a lot. Wait, no, Liam, we like trains here. No, we don't. Not anymore. I'm swinging wild, baby. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I was on the other side of the housing politics discussion, so we're not friends anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we like uh, you. There's some yeah, people yeah. who have opinions on housing policy we like. There's others whose columns we will be reading as safety third. <laughs> yeah, we will be. Uh, I also just want to say that, like, uh, one specific guy who I take issue with was just like, can't you engage and, and say anything other than socialism? And we said no, and he was like, this is the problem, and it's just like, I don't fucking care about you, bud. If like you, You're not gonna get a meaningful discussion on Twitter anyway, you know what you think, I'm not interested in what you think, you can absolutely suck my ass. And if you have to edit that out, go ahead. But that guy in particular can suck my ass. <laughs> I, I, I was talking to a friend of mine uh, late, I think it was November of last year, and she was talking about how, how one, she got back in contact with one of her old roommates, uh, who had become like a California housing Yimby uh, person, and had just gone from like bog standard lim uh, leftist to like serious Yang Gang person. <laughs> Ooh. Interesting. And I was like, this is, this is a corrosive... I have since then tried to eradicate knowledge of housing policy from my <laughs> no, uh, repertoire of knowledge. Yeah, it's it's, it's like, like an it's an informational hazard. Yeah, well, I, I will say, look forward to our housing policy bonus episode, which mm. is just me taking the most antagonistic positions I can for three hours. <laughs> it's like yeah. a video of like two of us independently knocking down walls with hammers. Bay Area zoning codes as a whole are in uh, a, a cognito hazard SCP. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I couldn't remember the SCP term. Fuck. I think the thing to do with housing policy is read all about it in like books smart people have written and then just never talk about it until, you know, it's a non Twitter discussion. No, it's bad off Twitter too. It is bad. I mean, yeah. But if you're talking with like an academic, it can be a bit more. Nope. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we already disagree. So yeah. Let's do it. Let's do trades. Let's no, do I, I, I haven't had too many unpleasant interactions about it offline, um, except of course when Liam and I were yimbied out of our apartment. But that's a different story. No, that's fine, dude. <laughs> density, density is the ideal in all situations, <laughs> and it's good to build shitty new housing because density for students who are being ripped off in buildings that'll fall down just as soon as the tax abatement's over. But who gives a shit? Because density, density, density. <laughs> Thank God Philadelphia doesn't have an excess housing stock or anything. That, yeah, fuck that, you. that should be a bonus episode one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But back to the subject. We're not going to talk about residential zoning today. We're going to talk about industrial zoning. Train zoning. Yeah, and we're going to talk about trains in cities. So, um, all right. If you're in a city today, you know there's a lot of problem with road traffic, right? Um, well, yes, I do, Roz. Yeah, as it turns out. <laughs> And one problem with getting, if only there were an easier way. Yeah. One problem <laughs> with just trans. getting more attention 
is, you know, truck deliveries, right? Especially in the pandemic. No. When we recorded this episode the first time, the pandemic hadn't even happened. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be, it's, it, they're going to get bored of trucks and they'll go into drones and then yeah. everybody's just going to be getting showered with like burning quadcopter wreckage all the time. <laughs> so, you know, everyone's ordering like a single banana off of Amazon, right? And that's clogging up roads from the suburban distribution warehouse to the city, right? How and, will uh, I get my treats? How will society survive if I cannot get my treats? You'll uh, well, we're gonna discuss an alternative way for you to get your treats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's we had a sophisticated uh, freight package delivery system which didn't rely on trucks for a very long time, and it's been almost completely abandoned. Right? We're gonna talk about. Well, I guess it's. This particular show has been expanded to talk about not only urban rail freight, but also like sort of industrial policy, right? But we're going to talk about both of those things. Um, mm. And, you know, also how that's affected unionization rates. I think that that's another important thing to talk about. Um, yeah, it's kind of kind of unfocused, but, you know, we're going to have a nice discussion about it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, fuck you. We're not doing a disaster this week. We're going collegial. It's a long, oh, yeah. rolling, slow disaster. <laughs> ah, okay. It's like the Scepter one. Yeah, exactly. So, you know that episode was only 44 minutes? Jesus, <laughs> what happened to How us? How far we've fallen. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is, this is St. John's Park Terminal in New York City. Um, and we're going to talk a, a little bit more about that in a bit. But first, we have to do... The goddamn news. <laughs> so this this Jericho painting that you've brought before us here, <laughs> the raft of the Medusa. <laughs> so a bunch of there's there's a bunch of uh, Trump uh, parade uh, boat parades. I think yesterday. Yesterday yep. is the day before Labor Day. Today is Labor Day. And and they were, they were like, um, uh, what's it called? They 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 had some problems. Well, the thing that Just you want few. to do when you have a bunch of extremely unqualified boaters. is to just cram a bunch of them into the same space and like do a bunch of close maneuvering. Yeah, that's what you want to do, famously. And so yeah, that's um, the ideal. Yeah, you you end up with as we see here. Um, a, a, a nice lady, I hope, uh, being swamped by the wake of a larger boat. And that is, you know, that's capitalism for you. You know, if you didn't want to, your boat to get flooded, you should have worked harder and gotten a nicer boat. Yes. I mean, it, it's, it, it, it's been, I, I used to spend a lot of time on boats. And like, it's astonishing how bad these people are at boats. <laughs> My counterpoint to that is something that a guy said to me on Twitter uh, today, actually. Which this was, is happening a lot, I'd say. Yeah, uh, which was, how many boats does Joe Biden have? And he's fucking got me there, you know? How many boats does Joe Biden have? Maybe one, if he owns a boat? Maybe he doesn't own a boat. In I which case, zero. a picture of a man in a kayak with a uh, Joe Biden sign. Okay, so he's got at least one boat, but still, though. Yes. I, I actually, uh, so I was at the, the Jersey Shore uh, this weekend. Uh, it was my friend's birthday, belated birthday, and we, we saw, you know, the, the, some of the Trump boat parade, but it was great because there were these, you know, big, dumb, idiot assholes with their boats creating wake, and specifically at a no-wake zone, because, of course, because the world revolves around you and you're the only person to have ever lived on this planet with 8 billion other people. Uh, and just there was a small boat, also Trump, behind them, and they just swamped the fuck out of it. And it was like, <laughs> you deserve this. Both of you deserve to suffer, and I'm glad that you are. <laughs> but you're right. that None of these people seemingly know how big their boats are or what to do with them, other than to be antagonistic little bitches. Mm -hmm. And it's all, it is also Trump's fault directly for encouraging them to do this, right? Like, they did this once, sort of, of their own accord, and then he was like, the big, beautiful boats, the boaters, and then just since then, they've just taken that as presidential sanction to, like, go and uh, sink a couple of their own boats. It's, it's pretty funny. Oh, yeah. I mean, it it's, is it's extremely it's funny. It's insanely funny, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Good Lord. Mm-hmm. You had a big boat parade. Do we still have a My new f- day? What? Oh, yeah, you are here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I am. I kept hearing I, I, some. I'm using the photo quite carefully. <laughs> my my favorite thing. Out. My favorite thing about this photo is that the flag, if you if you John Madden up the flag on the right, the rightmost one, um, um, it, it, it appears oh, to be... Oh, this one. Yeah, it appears to be a flag which has a photo of the American flag as part of that flag. <laughs> I, I imagine it's from a, a store called... I'm, I'm familiar with these people. It's like AAF Nation, obviously American as fuck. Mm. And they sell all sorts of patriotic things, but the website's currently broken at the moment. So yeah, it, it absolutely like got this from like grunge Barstool. style. This is just yeah, bar yeah, bullshit absolutely. So I I feel like the most America as fuck nation is the United States of America. One would hope, right? <laughs> I, I, I would think you'd be right about that. Yeah. I love to log on to chudgear.com to get some boating supplies. Chudgear. Oh yeah, chud we're gear. we're reclaiming the slur, chud. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In additional news. Uh the uh Colorado never change. Um, I, this is wild. This is this <laughs> Colorado is like now sort of uh, becoming my my ideal weather situation, which is is either you know about eighty degrees and sunny, or it's a blizzard. Hmm. Right. Except the sun is now like through a thick haze of forest fire smoke. Nah, that's the problem. You got some disadvantages with this, as it turns out. I didn't think this through. So luckily, <laughs> we have a case study here. This, you know that game Club Penguin. Yeah. There, there was the whole fire and ice part where you'd play that game and like. I guess throw fire and ice at each other. That's what this map looks like. Yeah, yeah. 100%. This is just a Civ, this is a Civ Five extreme weather map. Come what, to life. what we have what we have done by uh, performing anthropogenic climate change is make the world into Club Penguin. The floor is lava or ice. <laughs> I mean, my, my favorite detail this is not related to these fires because like everything's on fire but my favorite detail is that the El Dorado fire in California which has currently burned like 7,000 acres started by an errant gender reveal munition oh my god that's what we should have had as the news yeah, I wish I could have found a there's picture there's been two gender reveal wildfires now Oh, f- yeah. You, yeah, that's true. It's literally not even the first time this has happened. They had a smoke grenade that was going to like blast. Uh, I, I'm fairly certain, highly carcinogenic uh, pink or blue smoke uh, to indicate yeah. the the uh, the I guess assumed gender of this child. And uh, yeah, you just toss it in a bunch of dry brush. Stopped. Yeah, and now well, now your house burns down. It's gonna kill like you know. I don't know, 112 people, and then the mm-hmm. child is going to turn out to be trans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a decent chance it's not even an accurate smoke grenade, which is the <laughs> thing that you want to worry about in this situation. <laughs> yeah. Good lord. You gotta wonder what the long-term air quality impact of all these fires is gonna be. Well, it's a good thing we're not having a respiratory pandemic, right? I'm wondering when it's finally going to happen in the Pine Barrens. Oh, Mm. God. Oh, it's coming, bud. One of these days, there's going to be a big Pine Barrens wildfire, and uh, we will be dead. They'll finally find that Spetsnaz guy from season two of The Sopranos. Uh, Or the Jersey Devil. Yes. Oh, yeah. We, the killed we were the going Jersey to announce you that the Jersey Devil has been killed. <laughs> <laughs> Just like this is now a podcast tracking the the untimely demises of various cryptids. We haven't Mothman's talked about cryptids habitat, in a while. <laughs> yeah, Mothman's habitat critically threatened. You know the 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 Mothman, um, the the Jersey Devil died in a wildfire. I don't know. The Bunny Man got hit by a train. Um, the, uh, <laughs> I grew up near that place. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, definitely the forest fires are going to get Bigfoot also, and or Sasquatch. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know, there'll be like an earthquake that'll like beach the Loch Ness Monster. Um, <laughs> <laughs> R.I.P. The one in Lake Champlain will be interesting. Ooh, yeah. No, Champy can never die. 
Champy yeah. gets hit by a fairy. I told you. I just told you no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I used to be fascinated with that thing. Well, they're all real, folks. It's exactly. true. All right. So, yeah. so on to the end of the news. The goddamn news. All Did right. you forget that that was the only? Those are the only two news items. No, I have a preview of the next slide, so I know what I'm talking about theoretically. Ah, yes. that's, that's, that's how PowerPoint works. What's my um, preview of the next slide? Well, you could open There's the slides on Google that. Drive. I'm never going to do could that. Look, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have like a nice split screen thing going. I have the slides open on one side, and I have this open on the other side. Ah, so let's see. Like premium podcasting, yeah. <laughs> All right. It all fits on one little laptop. Mm -hmm. I thought it'd be useful to start with a brief explainer about how freight trains work, right? Well, you load a bunch of shit onto the train, and then you drive the train somewhere, and you take the shit off the train, and then it goes to the people's houses. Yes, the distribution if, if, you, if you play Transport Fever 2, that's how you'd think it would work. Yeah, I, I just I I load a bunch of oil onto a train so that I can unload it and load it back onto a plane, and then I fly that oil plane uh, across yeah. to a different town. And you have strong penalties for you know the amount of time it takes to deliver it because, as we all know, oil goes bad real quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why you got to put it in the plane. Yeah, <laughs> highly time sensitive crude. Yes. I yes, will point out, a... that was a thing that Boeing investigated, was flying oil from, uh, like, Canadian uh, wells to refineries, and then they realized, oh no, this is an insanely stupid idea to just fly yeah. around with a bunch of crude oil in the back of this fucking Boeing. Didn't the Japanese do that in World War II? Oh shit, maybe. Okay, I think it was the refined product they were flying around, but I vaguely remember reading something about flying tankers. Awesome. That... That sounds like the crude oil is one of the most incredibly dangerous substances in the world, like mm. far more than any refined fuel. Yeah, I can't imagine that. My God. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so the way a lot of freight gets moved on a train, right? So you'll have like a company that makes stuff, right, and they will load some like box cars, flat cars or whatever with their stuff, right? And then the short little train, the local train will come by and pick up those cars, right? And they'll pick it up. They'll bring it to a big railroad yard like this one over here, right? Mm -hmm. And there the cars get shuffled around based on their destination, right? So some cars might go on a train that goes directly to another yard. Some cars might go on a different train that goes to another yard, and then they get shifted around in the next yard. And you can use all of the cool little, like, shunting locomotives to break trains apart and move them together and stuff. Yes, or you have something called a hump yard, where yeah. they Excuse take the me? whole... The hump yard. You take the whole train, you shove it over a hump. <laughs> the cars coast down the hump because you uncouple them one by one as they go over the top. And you have a guy in a tower with a bunch of levers to switch the cars into the right track. Just playing extremely slow, extremely heavy pinball. That rules. Ye yes. 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 Now they use a computer, which is boring, but mm. it used to be a guy with levers. <laughs> Yeah. You used to also ride the cars down into the... Project modernity. Yard. Embrace tradition. <laughs> yeah, bring back the hump yard. Shit. I'm just... Well, they still, they still have them. Yeah. Um, they're trying to get rid of them. They haven't quite managed it yet. Big government overreach, once again. Yeah. <laughs> I just like the idea of, like, uh, if a guy rides each car down, there's just a line of guys waiting to get on each car. <laughs> Yeah, what you've yeah, done is you've invented the, the bus hump. again. <laughs> Congratulations. And then you, you gotta run, run back off. up after you've spotted one <laughs> Oh, car. like a ski lift, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Frantically going back to the top of the line to shut more cars. You got one, trip it over. <laughs> if you got one big train that goes from one rail yard to another rail yard, that's called a manifest train, right? Um, 
And that's just a whole bunch of different kinds of train cars. That's as opposed to a unit train where there's one kind of train car for the whole train. Where you need to move like a large amount of, say, coal or aggregate or oil, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sometimes yeah. you combine a couple uh, trains into like you'll have a unit. So it's like a CSX train that goes by me a lot, which uh, is combined. It's got the uh, a unit of Tropicana oranges. Then there's a manifest in the middle, and then there's a unit at the end of garbage from New York City. Do not mix those up. Yes. Yeah. No. <laughs> you don't want to do that. Oh, the garbage juice. Yeah, exactly. Oh, man, it really smells when it's like parked near the Schuylkill <laughs> River Trail. Just it's putting, really bad. Just putting a bunch, of, like a bag of garbage into a juicer. Yeah. <laughs> so, on the way back, um, this process is reversed. So, you'll put some cars into a siding for a local train. That'll bring it to a series of different industrial customers. They'll spot the cars on a siding, uh, and some people will come out and take the stuff out, right? That's how your freight train works. Straightforward. Yes. But there's not like, uh, it's not like how it works in Transport Fever or Transport Tycoon or w literally any train game that's ever existed. Those <laughs> bastards lie what, to what about the, uh, the shunting missions? The shunting missions in Train Simulator, which are my favorite. Oh, that's, that's different. That's a simulator, not a game. Ah, okay. Yeah. I see. That's serious stuff for serious people. Wait, can I t can I bitch about how Railway Empire just in place of a rail yard uses a big magic warehouse that trains just disappear into? Uh, yes, I think I think this is what uh, Jay and I played two days ago. And it's like, yeah, like the cars just appear and disappear. That was the same in Railroad Tycoon. Ugh. That's awful. Yeah, God forbid you have give, to worry about empties. Give me my rail yard. <laughs> Empties east, empties west. <laughs> <laughs> I need to send you that video for one of the uh, one of the Trash Future streams. Yes, uh, <laughs> please. You got to come on sometime. By the yeah. way, you and Liam. That would be fun. Oh yeah, that'd be fun. All right. So, anyway, so we usually associate this with uh, you know big freight trains. They go out. You know, they go around. They're big. They're fast. Fully loaded manifest freight train going 80 miles an hour is the biggest fuck you to aerodynamics in the world. Um, <laughs> but it used to be you could get these trains much closer into urban areas. Now, here, here's a good example. Um, so the London Underground used to have freight trains on it, right? Huh. Yeah. yeah. So this is just underneath the Smithfield Market, right? This is okay. a Great Western Railway tank locomotive taking some freight cars on the low London Underground. Uh, these are all full of meat, and they just deliver yep. it right in there in order to get the meat to the market. You don't need a truck, or in this point case, it'd be a horse and cart, right? Hey, and it comes pre-smoked, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Got that nice, nice like um, anthracite kind of uh, taste on it. I looked into grilling with coal once. Apparently, it'll give you cancer instantly. <laughs> <laughs> but does it taste good? Or? That's a good question. I'll have to try it, but I'll have cancer at the end of it. <laughs> 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 yeah, so this, this was on the, on the Circle Line in London. They would have freight trains, or goods trains, because it's Britain. Yeah. Goods, not freight. We, we actually call them motorized Rollingham's. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking bet you do. <laughs> pip pip, cheerio. <laughs> I have to load all of these meats onto the goods wagon. <laughs> there, was, there was sort of a, a, a mix of companies running uh, trains on the circle line in particular. I don't think there were any on the subsurface tube lines. Uh, one, one of the fun things is you're mixing freight trains or goods trains with rapid transit trains, right? Which, uh, is a problem because, of course, in England, uh, goods trains don't have uh, continuous brakes. Don't need them. Don't need them. Extra yeah. weight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have a guy turn the brakes in the locomotive, you have a guy turn the brakes in the brake van. What do you need brakes in the middle for? Do you want to go fast or not? <laughs> <laughs> 
There is at least one American freight railroad that has similar practice. Actually, one of the ones in, in New York City, this weird little offline terminal operation in Williamsburg, the Brooklyn Eastern District Terminal, Ugh, would like discharge <laughs> all the air brakes on the cars they were getting in, in Greenville or wherever in New Jersey, and then use only locomotive brakes for all the shunting work Good. on the Brooklyn waterfront. Good. Good. It, it, no it, slowing it, down. Not ever. <laughs> all gas, no brakes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was like it won't make it like on time, goddamn it. Regulations, I think. You had yeah. to pay people extra if you if you had air brakes or something like that. You just open the operator's manual, and the first thing it says is no brakes, and the second thing it says is the only notch is eight. One hundred percent throttle. <laughs> On-time performance or literally death. <laughs> Just careening off the end of a car float pier. <laughs> into, the, into the East River. <laughs> Alright, so th- this service, this sort of service was discontinued in the 1960s. You know, they replaced Aww. it with trucks, but of course over there it's called lorries. Motorized Rollingham's. Yes. Um... <laughs> <laughs> just make it up fucking names at this point. Yes. Freight buses. Yeah. So, oh, good. Uh, yeah. Stop it. <laughs> well, I mean, there was the post bus, which was just a van full of post and also passengers. They still have those in Switzerland, which we'll yeah, talk the, about they later. Rock. They still have them in uh, smart, Norway, they are, too, I think. They are really good. I want the yeah. LLV to double as a taxi. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want to I wanna, I wanna get an Uber, but it's a uh, Grumman LLV. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we should get the podcast in LLV. Ah, oh, shit. Well, they got to oh, start retire- retiring like them first. Well, they're all catching on fire. So that's right up our alley. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> so now if it's not like uh, trains on rapid transit tracks, it's stuff like this. This is 10th Avenue in New York City, also known as Death Avenue. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Shake hands with danger. <laughs> so... They would. They, there were a pair of tracks that ran down Tenth Avenue, right, where they would deliver uh, freight cars, mostly again full of meat, actually, because it went to the meatpacking district. Was the um, meat made of the stuff it runs over, or yeah, that's yeah. called efficiency. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we are once again Shop back local. to back to our our, our uh, bet noir from the atmospheric railway yeah. horse viscera. Well, nope. They used the horse to precede the train to get people out of the way. You had this guy, he's a 10th Avenue cowboy, right? Uh, and he huh. just tries to warn kids out of the way so they don't get mulched by the big train coming down, right? 10th Avenue cowboy sounds like an old-timey slur. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it sure does. <laughs> yeah. What's crazy is these trains were not moving quickly. Like, this was not something where you were, like, barreling down 10th Avenue at, like, 40 miles per hour. These trains uh-huh. were going like, 10. So it's this baby shit. No, 40. It has to get there on time. Why, <laughs> not why, why is nobody not talking about this? <laughs> that, was, that was, I believe, Syracuse, where they, they did just barrel down the street. Good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, this is why they built the High Line, as you can see in the background. Yes. High Line, of course, still there. Um, so... This went to St. John's Park Terminal, which was the first slide in this uh, presentation. Um, you know, this is this is also this is somewhat dangerous because again, kids just nah. kept getting killed by this thing. Um, Get out of the way of the big train! A free child meets. <laughs> the modest proposal. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a little bit of freight that was also help, uh, handled by the Manhattan Elves, apparently. Um, you know, it's sort of similar. And the subway. Did hmm. they did they try and jam freight in the subway? Oh yeah. The South Brooklyn Railway used to have freight rights to run freight trains through the Fourth Avenue subway between 36 and 59th Street, so they could get between their customers on the West End and Sea Beach lines. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, and oh then my also God. on the street oh trackage God. under the F line in Brooklyn. You, you just you you just you just sit, sitting there at the at the subway platform and suddenly like a 80 car freight train barrels through. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah full of coal. You just get no like, you're just yeah. breathing like pure coal dust. Coal, yeah. dust. coal was, yeah, no, coal, coal and also ash, I believe, were definitely big commodities for them. 
Oh, I remember that from um uh, uh fuck Fred, uh, Francis Scott Fitzgerald novel with the giant eyes, The Great Gatsby. The Great giant Gatsby, ash yeah. heaps. Yeah, yeah. That's where they tried to ship a whale once, but it didn't fit through one of the tunnels, so Aww. they could not ship the whale. That's just shears the off whale the okay? side of the whale. No, the whale was dead. They were taking it to Coney Island to display at the aquarium. What Aww. the fuck? The dead whale? They were taking the dead whale to display? Why didn't yeah. they think about the twenties? Must have been just the weirdest fucking time. <laughs> yeah, let, <laughs> kids, <laughs> kids, let's go, go to Coney to Island. We can see Westinghouse electrocute a fucking elephant to death. <laughs> they tried to ship a whale to Coney Island. You know, right. you know what the number one uh, like attraction in Coney Island was for a while it was horses diving off of a high board into like a pool of water, and it yeah. just you, you can see footage of it. You can see photos of it. There's just a horse at a ninety degree angle, like going straight down with a dude riding it, and it's just like nope, nope, don't like this. And you got a yeah. lot of dead horses. Why are you shipping the whale by rail? You know where you get whales? The ocean. You know what's next to Coney Island? The ocean. Yeah. Put it on a barge. My God. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's what they ended up doing when, it didn't, when they figured it couldn't fit. That, that was their second option. <laughs> that was their second yeah. they, 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 they just like, this was run by one of Roz's ancestors, and so they were just like, train first, everything else is like a backup plan to the train. All right. So this is a picture of the Chicago L actually in 1973. You can hmm. see here this this kind of locomotive is called a steeple cab, and it's delivering coal just on rapid transit lines. I think some of the spurs that they used to deliver the coal on are still visible even today. Yeah, it's they're, awesome. They're still there because I think they use them for maintenance away equipment. Oh, hmm. even better. That that steeple cab reminds me very strongly of, uh, and I talked about this the last time we recorded this episode, and I'm going to do it again, you can't stop me, yeah. uh, the Sacramento Northern, uh, my favorite train simulator DLC. Mm. Oh, yeah. Um, just doing interurban freight with a bunch of steeple cab locomotives. Yeah, that, that was one of the things they did in Chicago on the Ls. Um, you know, it wasn't just coal they delivered, they took away, they brought in uh, construction materials, took away construction debris. They also, you know, they, they brought in, like, lumber, they brought in all this crap, you know, yeah, just, you, uh, you take in mob concrete and you take out mob snitches. Yes, exactly. Yes. You know, they, they would, uh, they, they, they go in out. the belly of the whale just for the, uh, the effect. <laughs> ship, ship out yeah, a big go, block of concrete go. full of Jimmy Hoffa. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is actually a picture of the last train passing Berwyn Station in 1973. This was the last commercial ship oh, they freight shipment up nice. on the L. Oh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> but Alice, since you mentioned the Sacramento Northern, here's the Sacramento yes. Northern. <laughs> See, this is the advantage of not having the slide preview, is yeah. that each slide is a delightful surprise to me. So there's also a system of delivering freight uh, called the Interurban, right? Interurbans were mostly passenger systems. They were like big, fast trolleys that went long distance, right? Um, but a lot of interurbans also handled car load freight, like uh, this steeple cab locomotive here, driving down the street in Oakland, um, with three big box cars full of stuff. Mm -hmm. that, like uh, whatever racist products you needed. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> I, straight I, from the <laughs> racism factory. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these interurban lines would have even a limited amount of door-to-door -door service. They would have these special kind of trains called freight motors, right? Which is sort of like a trolley, but it's for freight, you know. And they would go, they would pull up in front of a business, and people would come and unload boxes, and then it would go to the next spot, right? This you is know? the best kind of mail rail. Uh, fuck a traveling post office. Give me a locomotive that pulls up to my fucking house, and a guy like says, "Yeah, your mail's in one of these box cars. Go crazy." Yeah, <laughs> and it's all electric too. That's the other thing. It one hundred percent electric, zero carbon, <laughs> kind of. Well, it's probably powered by hydropower. Um, a lot of stuff was hydropower until nineteen sixties, actually. Um, yeah, especially in the West. So uh, one of the things is like uh, people got sick of freight trains in the streets, 
Lose. Especially after they started losing cars. Yeah. Um, well, after cars, they really got sick of America. Them. Really has gotten soft. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes your child just got mangled by a freight train. It's not a big deal. Wait, no, make months, another have one. Another make one. another one. Exactly. This has better visibility. What are children than- but emergency rations with legs? This. <laughs> This steeple cab this steeple cab has better visibility than a modern Ford pickup truck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's 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 more visible to you in the cool orange. Yes. But but also yeah. you can see over the hood if you're going to mm-hmm. hit a child. It's got yeah. a bell. <laughs> yes. What else do you need? Also, you very frequently had someone riding on that front board there. You know, yeah, on the people. Yeah. Oh yeah, so you could yeah. watch the child get crushed under the locomotive <laughs> like that scene in Austin Powers. Gore cam. <laughs> yeah, my job is to be the most traumatized person in the Oakland area. <laughs> but a lot of people didn't like having freight trains in the streets, right? Nerds. Yeah, I know. So there, there are places like uh, here in Philadelphia, we had some anti-interurban legislature passed. Or that was in Pennsylvania in general, which mandated something called Pennsylvania trolley gauge, so they couldn't bring freight cars onto the trolley system. Right? We have that to this day. <laughs> Pennsylvania trolley gauge, I think, is five foot two and a quarter inches, whereas everything else in the country runs on four foot eight and a half. So you like nice even measurements, you know? You got you got to pull you got to push the rails apart. Um, yes, that's way easier than just saying no. You can't like you can't you're not approving freight traffic on a line. It's way easier to change the gauge. Eventually, you get to these big specialized freight systems, right? Um, like the Tenth Avenue uh, uh, freight line was so dangerous that eventually the city wanted to uh, the city wanted to rip it up. So they built the High Line, as Uday mentioned earlier. Now you can see here sort of the terminal of this line, the new St. John's Park terminal. Not as nice as the old one. Um, yeah. They just tore down a bunch of it. Mm. Like, really recently. I found this out like two weeks ago. <laughs> no. mm. But, you know, you, you bring in these freight trains full of crap that New Yorkers wanted, and you unload <laughs> full them. Full of Gabagool, or full whatever. Full Gabagool, <laughs> Yeah. Although notably not the shit train that comes out of New York. Yeah. It does yeah. not come in, despite the it's fact that they export it. Well, yeah, they, uh, they, they come in, they unload the Gabagool, and then they put in the A, I'm walking here. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then they forget about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this was, this, the High Line was done as part of the same project, the West Side Improvement that gave New York Riverside Park and, you know, the Henry Hudson. Um, and Robert Moses, of course, played a big role in all of it. Awesome. I'm sure that means it was, you know, there's no issues to investigate here. Oh, yeah. No. There were, yeah, plenty of... Plenty they should, of I mean, one thing they should do is they should still have the guy on the horse in front of the train. Like, just <laughs> in general, but especially here, just have a guy riding a horse down the track. No, that would be the thing. You take the modern High Line Park, right? Ugh. And you just put the trains back on it. Yes. And you have, you know, a guy and a horse proceed, and then it just mows down all the tourists. Yeah, you've got to get off the fucking <laughs> bench, or you will be crushed by a freight train full of Gabagool. Mm. Uh, the High Line Park, I think, is one of the most unpleasant places I have been to in New York City. It it's is. just so goddamn full of people. Oh my god! Which, like, and I know that that sounds, you know, kind of ridiculous, just considering how crammed up New York is. But like, there are places in Philly you can go, and you probably won't see another human being. And then you go to the Highland, you're like, ah, oh, a park. This will be fun, and it's fucking not. It's just absolutely 900 million Brooklynites who are like, why isn't the subway very good? I, I, t- I was told when I moved here that the subway would be good, and it's like, okay, so here's what we got to talk about. We got to talk about the fur maintenance, and also fucking shut up. You live in a city. Be an adult about it. But truly, they are all walking here. Yes. They are. Yeah, they are, because the subway doesn't work. No, you don't do very much walking on the High Line, because there's too many goddamn people. You remember <laughs> that time it tried to kill me? Oh. 
Yes, yes, that's true. Yep. You, you tripped over the the, yeah, the, the it little... tried to assassinate me. Yeah. One one of the strange like elevation transitions got to you. Oh no, it was like the little there there's like that little chain that prevents you from stepping on the vegetation. And Liam and tripped yet. over it. And well, almost those things died. Are a menace. Yes. Were yes. You yes. Into the vegetation? No, I wasn't, Uday. <laughs> <laughs> I saw um, a photo of like uh, a marine doing, like they were doing an urban exercise, like for Fleet Week in San Diego, and they had like taken over part of the like boardwalk, I guess, and literally captured this this guy. The photographer captured this marine in the perfect moment of like airborne trying to get over one of those fucking chains and just eating shit. Oh, they are the worst. <laughs> there's there, 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 so many people, so you can't even you know be embarrassed in peace. It's just people like people underestimate them. Shake. I did. Do not I have, sh I shook do feet not with have a loosely strung chain at like th uh, like shin level. Don't do it. Yeah. Mm. Or ankle level. Anywhere between That's there, it. it will absolutely murder you. You don't need concertina wire. What you need is... <laughs> it's a, it's shin yeah. level chains. Yeah. yeah just, put, just put some up from like a, a bistro owner who's like, oh, I think they'll look nice. And then, no. Shake hands. So I feel like this is kind of the pinnacle of urban carload rail freight, right? Um, you know, because it was just like, all right, we're going to build this elevated structure to get trucks and trains off the street, and we're going to have trains that just punch through buildings, and like, you know, we can just drop the freight off where we have to do it, and no one's going to have to deal with it on street level, right? Yeah, uh, trains that punch through buildings on purpose rather than by accident, like that one Amtrak. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> or the one we'll talk about later. So, it, other than this, this is mostly like big industrial freight. If you were getting packages, we had these things. We used this picture in the beer episode. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, we talked about PPR. Yeah. Yep. Blended 33 to 1. So, we had these things called um, uh, less than carload freight terminals, right? So what you see here is a bunch of boxcars on a bunch of sidings, right? Mm. And all these haul what's called less than car load freight, right? So, you know, it's boxes like... Boxes of uh, bananas and racism and sex dildos. Yes. Yes. Well, God, look how grimy the fucking buildings are! Oh, yeah. They still I mean, I, this is yeah. a thing. This is a thing in Glasgow still, where you can see which tenements are, like, pre and post- Air quality laws because some of the because the <laughs> new ones are like yellow and the old ones are now power washed but still grey. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's why they had to deliver so much coal on the L was because a lot of buildings had either coal heating or coal electricity uh, hmm. generating on the generated on the premises. Looks great, no problems here. I, I know, right? Everything's black, just <laughs> black. <laughs> Maybe some yeah, they gray. sign clean. Yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> so, what, what do you do at these less than carload freight terminals? Is where you might have a big distribution warehouse with a bunch of trucks coming in. Now you'd have a bunch of trains come in, right? And they would spot the boxcars on these sidings. Rather than having like a platform for each row of boxcars, what you did is all the boxcars were forty feet long. So you would just put some bridge plates in between each set of boxcars. And you could either transport, uh, transfer flight, freight from the boxcars into the warehouse and ship them out on tiny trucks, or sometimes you're even, you know, transferring freight from one boxcar to another based on the destination, right? So, you know, this is a very uh, uh, space-efficient way to bring an assload of freight into a city, right? Yeah, labor-intensive, though, right? Oh, yeah. extremely. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hand carts and well, your hands. There was very little automation. Yeah, you couldn't really get a forklift into any of these. Uh, Not with that attitude. Before palletization, <laughs> even they didn't even really have standard pallets back then. Yeah. Cool. This was handled by a company called the Railway Express Agency, um, which was an amalgamation of. Uh, a bunch of earlier companies which had handled express freight, uh, which mostly traveled on passenger trains and um, 
sometimes fast freight trains. Uh, the Railway Express Agency was the UPS of its day. Uh, fun fact, one of the predecessor companies of the Railway Express Agency, which I believe was formed by an act of Congress mandating the various express companies merge together, one of the predecessor companies was American Express. Huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Way back in the, like, Pony Express days. Huh. Yeah, they just, uh, they just decided, well, you know, we have a pretty good credit card business. I don't even know what they had at the time. We'll just let the well, they express were doing mail, weren't they? Go. Same as Wells Fargo. And then at some yes. point you decide, oh, hey, well, we're moving all of the, this money around by stagecoach anyway. Why don't we just start buying banks? And then you have a bank. That'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. Widely regarded as a huge mistake at the time. <laughs> Unfortunate that banking exists. Um, <laughs> should be handled by the post office. Anyway. Yeah, not least because it makes you have to model the various banks of the United States. I know, right? Well, I got both of them now. It's done. <laughs> 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 this is uh, this is a fun one. This is the Brooklyn Army Terminal, which still exists, actually. Is um, this a brutalism? It isn't, because no. this is well before brutalism. Uh, it doesn't look the same without yeah. the vegetation on it. I know. It's you, you, certainly the brutalists were inspired by. Yeah, because you can see the way this this is a, another urban freight terminal. They bring in the the boxcars full of crap, right? They take the crap out of the boxcar, and since it's a multi story warehouse, they have an overhead crane up here, and then you can see each of these galleries on the side of the building, right? And they're all staggered, so this big crane can deliver freight to any level of the building. Just arbitrarily at any oh, point. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that guy yeah, must have had a fun job. Bonkers. Yeah. Like it's it, like those giant, uh, like the. I always picture the you know the big ladders and libraries, mm. but just like on a grander scale, just mm. zipping around all day. That guy like, and the like hump yard guy have the good jobs in this episode, it, and the it, guy who has to ride the horse in front of the train, and then it gets mulched by the train, has the bad one. Yeah, hopefully yeah. he does not get mulched. The horse, you know, noble sacrifice, but our 10th African <laughs> cowboy. We went, through, we went through 14 horses this week. <laughs> oh, no, we're down two. That's not bad. Great efficiency, Jim. <laughs> now let's do a bunch of cocaine and drink soda with cocaine and codeine in it. Now, this is the real uh, I gotta part. take my radium drops. Where was, was the pooper scooper behind the horse or behind the train? No, there just wasn't a pooper scooper. No. You, you just get you just get what you get because what? that's that's good fertilizer. Stop crying. You live in a city. It's got to fertilize like those top. cobblestones. Were there yeah. municipal pooper scoopers? There must have been. Oh, I mean, I don't really think scoop is a word. Just municipal, like brushing it out of the way. Yeah, municipal garbage service was invented in 1870s Paris. So after that, probably when was DSNY founded? Um, oh, 1890s or something. Yeah, so probably, like, there was a good, like, 20, 30 years when it was just, like, nah. <laughs> I know there were, like, there were, like, articles published in, like, the teens and 20s, which was, like, by 1950, New York will be buried 50 feet under horsemen. Oh, over. no. Uh, <laughs> that that <laughs> news. Is. Prior, prior to DSNY's founding in 1881, uh, it was, like, street cleaning was done by the Street Cleaning Bureau of the NYPD. Which wow. is why it was so bad, was because you just left it to the cops. And so they're just like they just stuck in like a like a layer of like ash and horse shit and so on. I'm just sitting here. Do not let your cops be garbage men. It's too important a job to entrust to them. I'm just here in Philadelphia thinking, damn, it'd be nice to have street street sweeping. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Here we are in the goddamn dark ages. <laughs> so you know, so this is uh, an example of early multi-story industry, right? Um, well, not even early multi-story industry, because I guess early multi-story industry is something like, what's it, Lowell, Massachusetts, or somewhere like yeah, that. Well, but, yeah. yeah. Which is something we don't do anymore, and we'll get to that in a second. But I, I also want to do another fun one, um, which is the Central Railroad in New Jersey Bronx Terminal. Oh, oh yeah. it's a round bomb. Yes. This is uh 
This Welcome to the Thunderdome. <laughs> 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 Two <laughs> trains enter, one train, one train leaves. leaves. That's just the description of a small rail yard. <laughs> then slightly later a second train leaves <laughs> so they notice the, 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 the truck amphitheater in the middle yeah <laughs> on the there yeah, they they stage uh, mock truck battles. <laughs> like no, no, no. It's like a, you're doing like truck Lisa Strata in there. Yeah, <laughs> good truck jousting. S- Senatus Populus uh, Truculus um, Romanus. <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> Senatus Populus uh, Truckosaurus Maximus Truckosaurus Truckosaurus. <laughs> Just that. <laughs> <laughs> I badly want Senatus Populus Truckosaurus on a shirt. <laughs> well, if we were get there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fifteen years later. Yeah. <laughs> Someone, someone, give us an SPQR, but with Trekosaurus. All right. So, <laughs> so yeah, they, they, what they did. This is an example of a freight terminal which didn't even have like an, a a real connection to the mainline freight network. Instead of that, they brought cars in on a boat. Right. Mm. The boat would dock over here. You can sort of see this big wooden truss bridge over here that that connected to a boat. And then they'd take the cars out, they would spot them around this tiny little warehouse right here, unload the freight, and then they had a couple of sidings back here where they could more directly unload the freight onto trucks for local delivery, you know, as opposed to having to truck them in from farther away, right? And it also had a second siding that crossed a a street here, and then it went to, uh, what's it? I used to know what this was. Some some kind of big factory. Um so yeah, this, this is yeah, a fun the dick one. sucking factory. The dick sucking factory, yes. They delivered the dicks to be sucked. <laughs> 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 so what one of the fun things about this is because it's such a small terminal, they had absurdly complex track work. Um there's a, a famous section which is right here where this this little diesel locomotive, which is one of the first diesel locomotives ever built, lived in an engine house over here, and you can see there's a whole bunch of tracks that converge right here. Well, the way they did that was rather than have uh, a track crossing a track during a switch, um, they would just swap out this piece of turnout here for a piece of tracks that went this way whenever they needed to store the locomotive at the end of the day. <laughs> I can hear Gareth Dennis wincing <laughs> as we uh, uh, like as he listens to this. Right, we're doing two train episodes in a row, folks. Um, That's right. You paid to see it. Um, <laughs> Possibly. 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 Yeah. If it makes you feel better, the next pa- the next Patreon episode is going to be me complaining about sports for three and a half hours, baby. Get ready for that. Yeah, I, I mean, know that they do have a track crossing a sw- the switch like just above this one. That's if fine. You, like, that is a piece I of work so right there. Of you know, like we can have one, but you know, two is too far. Excessive, yeah. Yes. yeah. Well, I think this part they actually have to move the rails, so they tried to avoid that. Because you're actually you're actually trying to cross the movable points there. This is this is rail gore, you know. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, you can see that wooden bridge I mentioned before over here, right? You can see the freight terminal over here. This is how they got the trains over there. It's on a barge. Yeah, a train boat. Yes, like an well, airboat, but train. Every railroad in New York just had like a little navy. Of, of ferries and tugboats and these barges, and then there's another sort of barge called a lighter, which is you know something you you load your freight onto in the New Jersey side and bring across to piers in uh, New York that don't have train tracks. Or you can also um, put them on a what's it called um, a pier float, which is one of these car floats, but instead of having a middle track, it has a middle platform. So you can just bring the cars to some wherever on the harbor. 
and unload them onto the barge and then unload the things from the barge onto a pier or something. Or a... So, the lesson here is that, like, Donald Trump has some boats, Joe Biden has one kayak, but they're both outnumbered by the might of our next president, every New York municipal railroad. <laughs> Can you imagine the New York Central going to war, uh, having a naval battle with the Pennsylvania? <laughs> oh shit! That's that's a that's an alternative history I need. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> they get a bunch of they get a bunch of box cars with like uh, heavy machine guns in them. Uh, <laughs> is that a technical? Is it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listen to our our bonus episode we did with uh, the guys with Hell of a Way to Die about technicals. I wonder if that'll be out by the time we release that. This, um, well, it's coming soon, folks. Um, <laughs> So yeah, there's no track leading to this freight terminal, so they brought in the trains on the barge. Um, and this, this solves a problem which is, still exists today. Um, there's no real track connection between New Jersey and New York City, right? If you wanted Build to do that, one? if you wanted to Build. do that, you either had to... I mean, you could... They tried bringing trains through Penn Station. It didn't work. Um... The real way to do but it was... the trains not like it, or what? Well, the, the track profile in Penn is not very conducive to long and heavy freight trains, especially in the East River Tunnels. Um, it's a very sort of sharply V-shaped, you know, descent and then ascent into Queens, and that's not good for things like slack action and long freight trains. Also, the tunnels themselves are not, um, on, on the Hudson River side at least, are not secured to bedrock. They sort of are floating in the mud of the Hudson. So if you run a long, heavy freight train through them, you get some ugly vibrations that you may or may not want in a, you know, mud-floating tunnel. Hmm. They did, however, run um, what were called flexivans, which are basically a variety of shipping container in the 60s and 70s through those tunnels. Um, I don't know whether they just carried mail or something else. And I actually just finally found a photo of one of them today um, coming through Harold Interlocking in Queens, which is sort of the other end of Penn Station from um, the New Jersey side, or the tunnels leading to Penn Station, I should say. Um, but so the, the, insofar as like, you know, little containers count as freight trains, they did have those. I, I, I've heard a story that they tried to run a test coal train through Penn yes. Station. In World War II, oh, they did. Uh, it broke a knuckle about halfway through, so the back half of the train just fell away, and it rolled down, and then it rolled back through the station the other way, and then it rolled back the other way. <laughs> it kept doing that two or three times. <laughs> it just finds equilibrium, it's fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then it finally stopped, and they were able to get it out. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it it it's very difficult to bring a freight train through that particular tunnel. So the other way you do it is you go 65 miles north to Poughkeepsie, you cross the bridge there, and then you come down. Uh, since then, the Poughkeepsie Bridge has been turned into a rail trail. So today, you Lame. go 120 miles <laughs> up to um, Selkirk, which is just near Albany. Oh, Jesus. And then you come 120 miles down. Yep. This is fine. This is fine. I'm sure it's fine. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's great to go 240 miles to go two miles. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because you cannot build a bridge. Impossible. Uh, that 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 became illegal uh, after they built the Hellgate Bridge, and then then <laughs> in New York they just was like, no, no more bridges. No more bridges. Impossible. Um, well, yeah, because Robert Moses was in charge, and he he hated trains. <laughs> mm. The worst of his crimes. Yes. Oh yeah, that's it. That's the worst. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Moses' worst prejudice. Definitely not not the racism. Yes. <laughs> the racism against trains. Yeah, he's racist against trains. He's racist against Jews. He was racist against. The, uh, the irony is never really lost on, right? It's incredible how much he hated Jewish people, considering he was Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> Which, like, I'm sympathetic to. <laughs> uh, but even so, like, I'm not, I'm not in charge of uh, city planning, so. <laughs> My God. All right. As a result of this, there is actually still one car float service operating in New York City. We'll get to that. Um... 
Some other places were even worse than the Bronx Terminal. This is in Baltimore. Um, and they would have these rubber tired switchers. That's the coolest oh, car I've dude. ever seen. Yes. Yeah. I so just, badly want one. I love one it. day some dude is going to figure out how to put a knuckle coupler on his big pickup truck. It's yes. Be, yes. I mean, at that point, he's basically a track mobile, but still. More talk, yeah. please. <laughs> I, I mean, there are tra there are track mobiles exist today, but these are a lot cooler. And actually, what I should have put here is one of the souped-up tractors they used uh, initially, which mm. which are even even wilder. They look like something out of uh, 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 some kind of like wacky races thing. Mm. Well, this looks like it's a, like a prop from the movie Brazil, which used a lot of the like weird British designs Hold on, of I'm, like I'm... light truck and stuff. I'm actually going to Google this for a second. If you just search Brazil truck, you'll just get Brazilian trucks. But, um, yeah, no, I think there was like a, a, a short, like, no, it was like a scaffold commander or something. Uh, I'm badly mis- I'm mangling that name. Oh boy, this is where we all have to, um... This is where we all type. Google stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's a scammel commander. Um, yeah. I, I, they used a bunch of like because Britain in in like the 60s and the 70s just was like fucking going wild with trucks and was just like yeah fuck it we'll make one with three wheels don't give a shit um make one that's a train we know. made a reliant robin a truck yeah no they they literally had a three a a, a scammel scarab which um oh god i'm i'm going to put a photo of this in the um the discord chat for you all to look at and this is this is just for us. This is a like a room joke, I guess. But check out this fucking truck. Oh Jesus! Wow. Isn't that just the cutest thing you've seen in your I life? I do really like that. Uh, oh, it yeah. has a very sixties aesthetic to it. Hmm. Yeah. It is like it's well named. It's very Beatleish, you know. Mm, I, yeah. I found the one I was looking for. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, Look at that. Cool. You want to drive that thing around? <laughs> <laughs> I use this to move trains. This is an older one right here. Um, <laughs> Just d do a tractor pull. Do a tractor pull. You would definitely win the tractor pull with that thing. Very yeah. convincingly. It's also just such a testament to how little rolling resistance there is on a train that you can just pull freight cars around with one of these old tractors. Mm. Yeah, and uh, it wasn't just this is this is mostly in Baltimore where they use these switchers. It wasn't just Bal uh, New York City where they had elevated freight. This is one in Philadelphia. This is the Frankfurt Grocery Company, hey. this big distribution warehouse, right? Uh, still there, still actually used as a distribution warehouse. Uh, has a bunch of truck bays on the first floor. Um, but it also has this mysterious pair of doors on the second floor. What's going on here? Ghost train. Ghost train. Yes. You notice there's an abutment over here. The trains used to come in, they'd spot uh, boxcars, refrigerator cars full of food on the second floor. They'd sort, they, they, you know, sort them, they'd put them into trucks for delivery to local grocery stores, right? As opposed to trucking everything in. Now this big, uh... They had a whole dedicated right away that went directly to this warehouse. One of the problem was it was all downgrade. It was downhill the whole way. Oof. Yeah. So sometime in the seventies, some kids uh, decided to play it. <laughs> some kids decided to play a prank. <laughs> Good prank. <laughs> let let <laughs> let one of the boxcars loose in the yard by the Sears warehouse, and uh, popped out the other end of the warehouse. <laughs> 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 so all right um this is a lot about car load freight in cities like in terms of how we um you know used we used trains to deliver a lot of the freight that we now deliver with trucks get a lot of trucks off the road we've kind of gotten rid of this um now one of the things when the first time we did this i put this at the front of the podcast but now i'm putting it in the middle Another set of innovations that used to exist but really don't anymore are like specialized freight delivery systems. Um, 
So like in London, they had this thing called yes. Mail Rail. I yeah. love Mail Rail so much. Uh, it's a tourist attraction now. You can or you could before COVID like pay to ride in one of the mail carriages up front, and you have to like duck so you don't scrape your head on the tunnel. Low bridge, everybody down. So cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So th this this runs under. Uh, I think it runs between Mount Pleasant, which is the Royal Mail's big uh, sourcing office in central London. Um, and it it, it, you, it it saves you traffic. You know, you can get mail from one end of London to the other in ten minutes, say, when it would take you know an hour driving. Uh, and it also like uh, ties in with this whole network of like subterranean London, which is extremely cool. Uh, so like, there's a bunch of like buried tunnels from like World War Two down there. There's like a continuity of government shit. Uh, you know, you name it. And so this is the tip of the iceberg, but it's a really fascinating one. It's like a really extensive system too. They shut it down after a couple post offices uh, relocated, and they're like, well, it's more economical to use lorries now. Not trucks, mm. lorries, and, yeah. <laughs> and so they, they stopped using it, which is incredibly dumb, in my opinion, but what do I know? Yeah, and it really is like, it, I, I know this is going to sound perverse given what we're looking at, but it is smaller than it looks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my god. It is genuinely like a, a a miniature railroad that you ride on that was just like meant for conveying mail. I I think that's fantastic. I guess they had to fit two of them in a normal tube tunnel, so you know I, I yeah. gotta gotta keep them small. Mm -hmm. Um, you also had systems like the Chicago Tunnel Con Company. Um, they had about sixty miles of tunnels under Chicago streets. Um to, you know, deliver various crap from one building to another. Uh, Big department stores need their crap yeah. delivered directly to their basements. Yeah, every street in the loop has one of these tunnels underneath it. Um, and a lot of it was used to, you know, deliver stuff like coal for heating, um, coal ash from the heating you did. Um, various, you know. various odds, various <laughs> mob odds snitches. Crap. Yeah. Wait, why would you be delivering the mob snitch? Retrieving the mob you're snitch. Retrie retrie no, you're yeah. delivering him. You know why? <laughs> He's wearing a wire. <laughs> Johnny Sack got to meet with you, and so you go to the sit down by getting into a tiny little fucking tunnel train. <laughs> What's the most annoying way to die? That's gotta be pretty far <laughs> Yeah, up getting there. fucking garroted like Luca Brasi, but like, it's by a guy who's sitting behind you on one of these. <laughs> I think what they have here, uh, you see this is like a sort of steak flat car here, right? Hmm. And it's actually carrying two smaller carts on wheels here, which they would have just taken out and then wheeled into a building. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And all these tunnels are still there. Um, the, the tracks aren't. They use them for utilities now. Um, in 1992, someone bored through the wrong wall uh, in a basement somewhere, and uh, oh, the entire Chicago River um, came through that borehole. Oh, it and didn't. Then it wasn't the someone boring through. It was like a barge got loose, like we talked about on uh, a previous episode, <laughs> and it like <laughs> knocked through part of an embankment, and the river was just like, "Yep, extra river now." Yeah, and then every every, basement, every building <laughs> every is now building flooded. flooded. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite thing is reading about this, um, like, the delay of extremely Chicago municipal politics of the time when it is flooding, and when the guy whose barge hits it says it's flooding, and a bunch of other people <laughs> say it's flooding, and the mayor going, I think still a daily at this point, is going, no it's not, it's fine, don't worry about it. <laughs> I like that, I like that approach. <laughs> well, his, his, his constituents aren't You're exactly going to have an opinion on that. Because <laughs> they're dead. So, Chicago politics, fucks. Um, <laughs> so, so, what happened to all of these uh, nice freight systems we had? Uh, General Moses. Yes. Oh, oh, hey. 
<laughs> they a lot of people want to get trains off the streets because they kept you know running over kids. Who gives a shit? So Sentimentality. Trucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what else runs over a lot of kids? Trucks. trucks. Yes. So, uh, sort I mean, of, I, I refuse to do any math to work out whether it's more kids, but also I don't care. Yeah. Um, there's a big decline in the railroad industry, also deregulation, which meant freight railroads could set their own rates, as opposed mm -hmm. to have regulated rates. This is supposedly so railroads can compete with trucks, but in reality, sure. the railroads just decided to cede whole markets to the trucking companies. Capitalism breeds innovation, goddammit. Yes. <laughs> a lot of urban customers were rendered obsolete, like uh, coal dealerships especially. You know, because coal, coal dealerships, you know, you'd pay to bring the coal in, you'd pay to bring the coal ash out. Um, yeah, you don't really need a lot of that anymore, which is probably a good thing. Yes, this is true. Yes. Uh, I mean, that's my, my professional managerial class take, celebrating a bunch of workers losing their source of employment. I, I don't- A bunch of coal miners really pissed off right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really the fundamental story here, though, is of who pays for infrastructure. Hmm. So, and now it's FedEx. Pay. Yeah. Yeah, trains Except people... also they don't. So, like, yeah. trucks, as, as we've established, cars don't damage roads, trucks do. And yeah. uh, it's, it's not like FedEx is paying to maintain the roads, right? Yes. And that was, that's sort of the crux of the issue, you know? Especially, as you say, after deregulation, there was very little incentive given, you know, the, the, these sort of hidden subsidies for trucks for, you know, railroads to keep competing in a lot of these markets. Yeah, because you can just jam ass loads of these big ass trucks down any street with impunity, and you're not paying yeah. for maintenance on there. Um, and like trucks do the vast majority of damage to our road infrastructure, um, as we sort of mentioned in the Salang Tunnel episode. Um, <laughs> and and so now we're sort of stuck with this this status quo where trucks make every delivery everywhere constantly. And like big trucks, bigger trucks than we need in a lot of cases. Um, you know, I, I yeah, see because it. America never embraced the van, the only good mode of road Wolf. transport. Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 one of the things about trucks is, you know, they are you know pretty space inefficient, right? Um, hmm. I put this slide here. I didn't think I did. Um, you start seeing these these big uh, big distribution centers pop up. So this is actually one that's currently being planned in Northeast Philly. This is actually on the site of the former Bud Car Company factory. Injured uh, insult. Yeah. <laughs> Back where they made the streamlined trains. Um, now they're going to build a, I think, a UPS distribution facility. Um, awesome. We can have a bunch of people reenact our last safety third and get crushed by, like, barbells. <laughs> yeah. But also now getting COVID. Mm -hmm. Are those pawns on that site? And if so, why? So the mm -hmm. first thing I thought was they were remnants of the golf course, which is currently there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can play what full holes. Fucking city. I know, right? We used to make trains. Then it was a golf course. Now it's going to be giant truck park. Get your single yeah. bananas. Yes. Trucks in, yeah. trucks out. I've never fully understood how these things work because it's like you bring a 53 foot truck in and then another 53 foot truck goes out I, I, yeah. it's, it's like it's cross docking like you bring in i don't know your shipping container of imported goods from i don't know choose a country india and it's all a bunch of i don't know hammers and then you know you have trucks going to your distribution centers in Chicago, Milwaukee, Rochester, and Syracuse, um, and each one of them needs a quarter of the shipment of hammers. But then they also need you know the rest of the truck to be filled up with other sorts of things for those destinations. So what you do is you break up the the inbound loads and in resort them into you know loads that are you know more mixed for the hmm. delivery. You're doing noticed. the same process and s as slide two, just uh, all over again, yeah, yeah, much yeah, less yeah. efficiently. And much more space. Yeah, and 
because we know we, we, we god god forbid we build a multi-story warehouse these days yeah or like you know maybe Train. maybe move a lot of these shipments in like one big unit as opposed to a bunch of trucks yeah um, <laughs> what if what if we took a bunch of truck trailers and put them together like they do in in scandinavia where you can have like a b trailer behind your main trailer and then we put we kept adding trailers until you had everything you needed you put a really powerful truck at the front of it and then you had some kind of like permanent road for it mm. Mm. ah cool. the new york thruway yes <laughs> <laughs> Turnpike doubles. <laughs> <laughs> those are like I I just enjoy seeing those because they're so ridiculous. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think there's triples in some parts of the country, but they're smaller trailers. They're not the full fifty three footers. Yeah, they let you do triples out west. I know that much. Yeah, um, yeah Montana. And, 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 and I am reliably informed in, by American Truck Simulator that in Montana, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, excuse me, in Nevada, there are no laws. So. Yes. Just going gotcha. nuts. There's no laws in Montana either. Mm. Mm. There's like huge swaths of the country with no laws. I don't understand why these areas. Well, that's probably why they're so big on Blue Lives Matter because there are no laws the police enforce, so they never have to deal with them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so probably the only good way to be a cop is like to be a cop in a place with no like population and where no one ever goes through. Oh yeah, you're just, you just a guy who gets to wear a cool hat then. Yeah. Exactly. Well, rural, rural cops are the fucking worst, man. Can't confirm. Because <laughs> you just get the opportunity to take out your failing marriage on somebody just passing through. And you you really need them to know how bad that marriage is failing. <laughs> you run the speed trap on like Route 11? <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, um, you know, the, all these trucks have to come in and the, like these these facilities produce ass loads of truck trips every day. They're really bad on local roads. Um, this is a nice chart of how much damage various vehicles do to roads. You know, just sort of <laughs> I as, just saw the bottom line. Yeah. <laughs> this is from Street for the benefit, and then <laughs> for, for the benefit of the the audio only listener, uh the the chart begins with nine ton big rig and ends with fat man on a freakishly heavy bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> which you describe as weighing three hundred and fifty pounds. Yeah. Like I'm curious. <laughs> I'm curious what the like freakishly heavy bicycle weighs in this equation, right? I think it's probably between fifty and seventy five pounds. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I know the I know the bike share bikes here in Philly. Um, the regular ones weigh fifty pounds, and the electric ones weigh fifty four pounds. Mm. So you just got to have the other like two hundred and ninety six from somewhere, which I'm getting there. And I, I, feel you. I, I, feel I too you. Yeah. can do point zero 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 six uh, percent of the damage of Never an stop average believing, car. Alice. Yeah. yeah, that's right. This, this chart, like, your road wear is proportional to the fourth power of the weight on each tire, right? As I mentioned in the Solank Tunnel episode, so your average car here is one, right? It's 4,000 pounds. So your nine-ton big rig does as much damage to the road as 410 cars. Hmm. This is why when you design bridges and roads, you design for trucks. You ignore cars. Everything else is seasoning. Yes. That's yes. so why people say, well, why, why don't these bicyclists pay, like, taxes? Why isn't there a road fee for bicyclists? Why don't they have license okay. plates? There is. It's point zero 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 six percent You have to mail them a penny at the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> and that's only if you own the freakishly heavy bicycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, my cast iron bicycle arrived. Yeah. <laughs> you could even pay it part of like an estate tax when you die. You know? Mm. You owe like four us cents of road damage. Cough it up. <laughs> <laughs> you have to, uh, you, 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 what, what you could do is you could cheat. You could get a bicycle with extra, like a wide tire, and then you're doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
or three axles or something. Just a, yeah, a, a fat man on a freakishly wide tricycle <laughs> is the most <laughs> efficient. Is the most efficient method of transport in terms of road wear alone. You you will never do any wear to the road if you just did. If you just if if everyone just did bicycles, right? It, it would never. It would. It, you could have laid asphalt in like one thousand BC, and it would still be fine. Except for damage from trees, the tree always yeah, wins. That's yeah, yeah. Uh, this, this is this is uh, the, uh, something else you learn in engineering, as well as everything leaks, is the tree always wins, unless you cut it down. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one language they understand. Mm -hmm. You need to be forceful with these things. <laughs> <laughs> Introduce some Dutch elm disease. Fuck you. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> All right. So Ude gave me this nice graph, which describes uh, what we're going to talk about here. Um, other factors that have increased the amount of trucking as opposed to trains is suburbanization of industry, right? You know, yeah, you have a big industrial park with all of the factories, and now, on the plus side, you're not across the street from a paper mill, but on the other hand, all of this shit goes to, like, one place, which then, like, destroys the area around it. Mm. It's also worth noting that these sorts of industrial parks were not really a thing before trucks. You needed the, the sort of, you know flexibility and where you can go that a truck affords to create these things. Mm. Railroads encouraged much more sort of corridor-based, generally multi-story industrial development. One, um, one criticism I will make of the boxcar, very wide turning circle. Mm, yes. Although if you have a smaller boxcar, it's a smaller turning circle. Yeah, bring That's back the 40-foot boxcar. <laughs> yeah, 40-footers were, were good for that kind of thing. It's also worth noting here that you know, obviously there was more than just trucks pushing industry to the suburbs. You know, there was, and I'm sure the others will have more to say on this, but... Um, there, there were absolutely no factors which we may have talked about previously in connection with one Robert Moses, <laughs> leading to the suburbanization of uh, America in particular, there's yes. absolutely no no politics going on here. Yeah, there is only politics. one red line on this slide. <laughs> yeah. Yep. You know, so we start suburbanizing industry. A lot of light industry moves out of the suburbs, which is always the interesting one because the heavy industry tend to have enough fixed infrastructure that it kind of stayed where it was. That's why, you know... Not a lot of light metal shops in Philadelphia, but there was until recently a major oil refinery. Um, <laughs> Difficult to gentrify that. This is true, yes. Uh, well, they're going to turn it into a distribution center. Uh, <laughs> mm. But yeah, you, you know, you go out to the suburbs, you relocate your light industry to these nice stylish white boxes, you know, like one story white boxes. You get a bunch of trucks coming in. Um, you know, and sometimes it's good to get heavy industry out of the city. Heavy industry tended not to be the one that moved. It was light industry. And the other thing is like, you move industry out to the suburbs and it, it's, you, you start to get a more suburban workforce and they become homeowners. They become, you know, they drive to work as opposed to taking- They start buying boats yes. and putting flags- sure. On yeah. the boats. And uh, most of them stay afloat. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what you do is you create boomers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. You make it a bunch of money, so you think, why do I need a union? Yeah. <laughs> That's taken it's up. It's organize in the suburbs, you know, for all the, you know, social reasons that are talked about in connection with the suburbs in general. Yeah, it's like who, 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 you, you have like two neighbors at best, you know. Yeah, it's like you have uh, I don't know some white collar guy, and then like Carl who works for a different industry than you do. Like you know, you're not talking to your coworkers like off hours ever. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. these sorts of plants were also important insofar as they sort of provided redundancy for you know larger plants in cities. So. You know, if a, if there is some strike at your your big 
you know, main production facility, you'd have a backup source of, of, you know, production. And it was also helpful um, as a bargaining chip, you know, you can, you can threaten workers at a unionized plant with a runaway shop. So moving their jobs somewhere else, if you have other sort of duplicate production facilities decentralized across a, a country or a region or whatever it is. And that was especially important in just, you know, talking about, you know, labor politics in the auto industry after, you know, the 1930s and stuff like that. Yeah. And one of the most interesting things I think you, you gave me was, of course, this chart here, manufacturing activity in Chicago versus the metropolitan area, right? And and you can sort of see you have this one line, which is manufacturing jobs in Chicago going down. And you have this other line, manufacturing jobs in the suburbs, which is, of course, generally going up. Right. And of course, we go to that next slide, and you can sort of see the like the total number of manufacturing jobs in this midwestern, you know, Rust Belt region. Oh shit! Hasn't declined that much since 1950. <laughs> to be fair, this chart only goes to like 1997 or something, so I'm sure there's been changes since then. NAFTA, baby. <laughs> yeah. For the sake of full disclosure, I copied all this data by hand from old PDFs of census documents. So thank you for your service. You, yes, thank you for your service. <laughs> you, you can't Sorry see me, but I'm saluting. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saluting, but I'm saluting in the fucked up British way where it's like palm out. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> But like even in 1997, the jobs in the suburbs were increasing. There's still like an upward yeah. trend there. Yeah. 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 It's like the, uh, one of these things about like, uh, Trump's going to bring manufacturing jobs back. The man manufacturing jobs never went away. They just dispersed. <laughs> the suburbs, the Sun Belt, the, well, yeah, things like this. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. the, the, and then lastly, Mexico. Your big, your big rural. Uh, industry. Uh, yeah. What do we got? We got Nissan in Canton, Mississippi up here. And uh, GM in Spring Hill, Tennessee. These are plants in the middle of fucking nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't one of these just vote to uh, unionize? Like, recently? I'm not thinking... Yeah, I mean, maybe I'm I'm misremembering, but I'm certain there was one in in Tennessee. I don't know if it was Nissan. There was a long unionization push at um, the VW plant, and I think Chattanooga. That was yeah. I don't think it was successful. No, it wasn't. Uh, they tried for years. Yeah, yeah, I think they tried twice actually. Yes, I believe so. Yeah, I thought there was one where like VW was even like, yeah, I think a union is not a bad yeah. idea. Even like the management was like, yeah, that's probably fine. Yeah, and, the, and yeah. he's like, no, not going to happen. Like politicians yeah. intervened. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the German labor relations system is a lot less adversarial. Well, you know, generalizing, of course, um, yeah. than in the U.S. So you know, the Germans I don't are like used. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the german system of selling out <laughs> yeah i i am the union man i uh <laughs> <No>. <laughs> i build the panzer tank <laughs> yeah but it's fine because the workers have a seat on the board of the factory that builds the panzer tanks this is true yes well mm. It's called National Socialism, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so you move all this shit way out into the middle of nowhere, and it's suddenly like, you know, cost of living is cheap, cost of land is cheap, you can have facilities that are cheap to Next run. Next to a nine-lane highway. Yeah. You can also design it however you want to, because you're literally working with farm fields, which is... I don't know, if you're, if you're an industrial engineer, it's nice. Hmm. Oh, yeah, you can just eat up a shitload of land, yeah. Yeah. One of the sort of more obscure, but in my opinion, interesting um, drivers of the whole suburbanization, ruralization, industry trend is the advent of electrified production lines. Because before electrification, you had to, like, run everything in the factory off of a series of like, inter interconnected, like, con like, not conveyor belts, but, you know, belts and 
chains and whatever overhead um, belt systems yeah exactly yeah. and <laughs> you you'd have a if you put things too far from each other you know you would lose significant amounts of energy with distance so it made sense to stack things on top of each other and put things as close together as possible but that whole equation changed when you know you have electricity and you can just put a motor and everything and put them at a nice straight line and produce that way you heard it here first folks factorio is bad <laughs> <laughs> fuck electricity society has <laughs> progressed beyond the need for electricity yes <laughs> Reject modernity, embrace tradition. Yes. That's right. <laughs> yeah, so you get these massive sprawling facilities way out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and, you know, again, you, you, you get the sort of atomization of the workforce because, you know, they all, they're all now homeowners, right? You know, they're, um, they, they have a car, they have a lawn, they have a house, you know, they, they have a bunch of excess money why do I need a union? And, you know, one of the things is, of course, when these industries decide eventually to go overseas, there's going to be no organization to oppose that. Correct. <laughs> but Trump said he was going to stop that. Yep. Yes. That's what's going to happen. That's that's what Trump does, <laughs> is to do what he says he will. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm not offshore manufacturing. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. That would be... That would be rude to the people who be unethical. Him, who he yeah. cares about. Yeah, exactly. I'd love to know what the Chinese working class are doing right now. I <laughs> oh, you should watch a documentary called American Factory, which is very oh, much yes. about um, uh, Fuzhou, uh, which is a Chinese glass company for automotive glass, uh, buys a factory in Michigan and takes it over. It used to be a GM, I think. Um, and it, you're just like... And the whole time you're watching this thing, you're watching these Chinese workers who are just being immiserated, and these American workers who are just being immiserated, and you're put you want to like push them together and be like, now kiss, but with like class consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, this is part where I stuck the podcast together and I don't I lost my train of thought, but we have a train here on the slide. Um oh boy. So containerization, right? This is another thing which sort of affected um, why there's so many trucks in urban areas is like a lot of freight now moves in big shipping containers. Not inherently bad, but, you know, every shipping container trip is a truck trip on each end, right? Um, Except in Switzerland, which we will talk about, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Also, uh, had the advantage of not destroy doing the thing that you do to a union that you can't destroy, making the longshoreman irrelevant um, by transforming it from a mass job into something that requires a few highly technical, uh, highly skilled employees who still have a very powerful union, but now they're the union of guys who like operate cranes and stuff, rather than a union of like six thousand mob affiliates all like pulling nitroglycerin on and off a phrase of giant fucking hooks yes. all the time. <laughs> right. Yeah, and they're like, um, you know. The containerization, I think, is a very mixed bag. I, a lot of people think this is like the the way of the future. You know, this is the way we're going to ship everything. I, I I think that there's good and bad with it. A lot of the bad is union, like destroying unions, which is obviously good mm. for a lot of other people. Um, it's very profitable. It's also the whole capital mobility thing. I mean, before containers, you know, and obviously they're multiple sides to this argument and i i personally am you know in the middle um i'm a carload guy i think we should go back to only carloads uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, for freight for freight rail sure but yeah. for international sea trade this made things a lot you know cheaper to ship and so less explodey now, mm -hmm. yeah exactly and you and you see so, you, know, you now can trade profitably with you know kind of anywhere and Which is, again, as you say, a double-edged sword. You can have the same container port, and I mean the same, identical container port, in pretty much anywhere in the world with the oceanography permitting. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, those containers can just be picked up and plopped on a train or a truck or a barge, even, to be moved inland. Mm -hmm. It's a 
it's a very flexible and efficient system from from you know a, just a sort of three thousand feet logistics standpoint. It obviously has ramifications for you know labor power and you know the the organization of the world economy, um, which is you know a whole nuanced and complicated episode in and of itself. But it it did make trade a lot easier. One of the things I think is a problem in the United States, though, especially with containers as po- uh, for rail freight, which we'll get into later, is this thing called the well car, right? Which means you can never, ever, ever deliver a container directly to a customer using a train. Um, yeah. <laughs> but we will get into that later. Um and of course, what, what, another big problem is uh, okay. So we we deliver containers a lot of the times to something called an inland port, and in order to get the container to its final destination, you use uh, uh, you use trucks, and that's a service called drayage. And drayage has some of the most incredibly exploitive labor labor practices oh, yeah, yeah. anywhere. <laughs> so you, yeah. you, you you are you are. You are getting people to pay you to work. Um, <laughs> is it like lease, uh, rent to own big rig schemes and a whole bunch? That, that'll be, we'll have to do an episode on that because it's it's some of the grossest shit I've ever heard of. Um, yeah, it's, it's yeah. also judgment like. Yeah. And it's just that, yeah. There's a good book if you any, you know, you or listeners are interested, um, Getting the Goods. It was put up, I think, Cornell's Labor Relations School, and it's a bit dated now, but it's a really interesting, in-depth look into labor politics in the sort of port ecosystem in Southern California. Ooh! I read it this summer. Good stuff. I, that seems like a good idea. Buy the buy the book. All right. Buy the book. Mm-hmm. Yes. I am not affiliated with this, but in any way, so this is just a, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm not getting money for promoting this book. <laughs> So the result of this whole like suburbanization, ruralization of industry is a lot of industry sort of abandoned, you know, uh, rail service where they had to stay in the city. A lot of industrial buildings were repurposed for either offices or residential use. Um, or coffee shops. Or coffee, yeah, coffee shops, you know, a brewery, you know, you got like all this kind of crap, right? You know, you, you, you can see like... Uh, Here's a series of buildings. This is in Brooklyn somewhere, I believe. You can see clearly yeah, right. these are all designed for the railroad to come in and spot some cars. <laughs> and they're using it for truck parking. Um, That's depressing. Yeah. And Bushwick, mind you, has some of the worst air quality issues in the city. Oh, yeah. Largely thanks to the amount of truck traffic in the area. The trains are obviously diesel polluters as well, but you can haul each, like each individual train car of which you can, you know, you can couple together many to make a full train. That's three to four trucks. That's how trains so, work. Yeah. So <laughs> you just attach stuff to the fucking end. Why are you exactly. going to make the train longer? Oh my God. <laughs> it's like a buffet. <laughs> Why don't they do that with trucks? Oh, cause you take out 75 traffic lights, right? <laughs> Only positive thing you can see over here is Manhattan Beer Distributors, which gets all the beer in New York City it comes in on trains. <laughs> yeah, if you buy massive real customer. Yeah, if if you buy beer in New York City, don't worry about you, your carbon footprint. <laughs> yeah, you are supporting the rail industry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just please do a- not buy dark fruit cider. Yeah. <laughs> The, the 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 local freight railroad in New York has been termed the pizza and beer railroad because it carries so much flour and so much beer. I like that. Mm-hmm. That makes me happy. That's good. But yeah, you get, yeah, train guys. Train is good, as it turns out. Um, Who knew? Yeah, we did. God damn it. But yeah, it's like the railroads can uh, concentrate on unit trains, intermodal containers. They want to bring down that operating ratio because, you know, long distance hauls make the most money. Um, and we'll definitely talk about that when we eventually do the Penn Central episode. Um, you know, because they want to bring down, 
it, they want to bring down the operating ratio, which is what the railroads use instead of a profit margin, because the profit margin for a railroad is like 20%, but the operating ratio is 80%. You know, they want to make uh they want to make the investors happy, right? And right. railroads are very bad at providing car load freight service in general, especially with a lot of the implementation of PSR that currently exists. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and P PSR for the record is when you use computer to do train. Yes. Yeah. It's also okay, I would I would disagree with the assessment that PSR is always bad for car load freight, but for another time, given that we've now been podcasting for two hours. Yes, I, I guess we yeah. gotta move through this quick. Yes, please. Um, I'm please, dying. Yes. All right, all right, all right. So, <laughs> yeah, I should just go to the next slide. I got a lot of notes <laughs> on here. <laughs> so, I guess we gotta sort of talk about uh, how is this being handled in Europe, right? Uh, uh, yeah, I know, right? Um, Europe. Europe, yes. <laughs> or Europa. Hmm. <laughs> Oi, Ropa. Yes. If you know what I mean. So, Europe. Oi, Europe. Yes. So, all right. So, there, there's such a thing as national freight policy in Europe. Like the Germans mm. will say, if you got a bunch of shit coming into your industry, your commercial business, you have to use trains. Um, there's a thing called Swiss Split, which I believe Uday knows about. <laughs> Yeah, it's basically, imagine if you replace the drayage part of an intermodal container's Germany, or journey. Um, so taking the container from the intermodal terminal where it comes off of the train or the boat to the, the warehouse where it gets parked at a truck dock. Imagine if you replace that part of the journey with the train. So instead of loading um, the container onto a truck at an intermodal terminal, you load it onto a different type of train that has these specialized flat cars um, where you can actually unload the container on the flat car, which is what you're seeing in this photo here. And this is from an IKEA warehouse in Basel in Switzerland. Hmm. Um, oh. In Switzerland, they trucks have to pay a lot more to drive around than in the U.S., which makes this sort of thing more economical. And I believe yeah. the, Swiss, the, Swiss, the Swiss psychotic hatred for uh, like automotive road transport is extremely funny to me, yes, uh, yeah. especially since like parts of it are like bear absolutely no resemblance to motorsport in Switzerland. Banned. No reason. <laughs> fuck you. Um, have, <laughs> having having like an a exhaust crash, like a hundred and five years ago or whatever. Yeah, yeah. and have, that's the, like that's a pretense they use. Having an exhaust on your car that is like two decibels too loud, and the limit is set absurdly low, and they will measure it. Um, Go to jail. Go to fucking prison. <laughs> I do. I do like the idea, though, of just some asshole following you around with a decibel meter. Yes, He's like, nine, literally. Nine, yes, nine, nine. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, fucking drive around. Drive around with unusual number plates in Argau and see what fucking happens. There will be a guy in a silly hat with a decibel meter along in seconds to take you to fucking prison. <laughs> Give us our gold back. <laughs> Does he have to read you your rights in four you languages? You don't have rights in Switzerland. You know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you are getting disappeared to a black site somewhere yeah, you think, in Zurich. You think you have rights in Switzerland? No, you don't. No. <laughs> you have broken the social contract and you will be shot at dawn. Yeah, we, we have this, like, rescript here on parchment that says if you're suspected of being Albanian, I can stab you with a fucking halberd. <laughs> They do make you deliver shit by train. I think that's good. Yes. <laughs> yes. Land of contrast. Land yes. of contrast. Land of contrast. Um, you know, because they have like a national policy on delivering freight, which of course we don't have in the United States. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah. Man, maybe Metaglavius is right. The federal government really can't do anything. <laughs> the federal government can do anything it wants to. <laughs> they have the nuclear weapons. Look, how, how many how many nukes does fucking Nebraska have? None. If Palo Alto doesn't want to build affordable housing, what you do is you station a bunch of uh, artillery in the big military. <laughs> how many base. battalions does yeah. Steve Jobs have? Yeah, <laughs> just start dropping flyers 
that show pictures of Grozny after the Chechen war and say, this is what will happen to you if you don't build affordable housing. I, I feel very strongly that this is the kind of thing that is getting you suspended from Twitter on YouTube. <laughs> All right, uh, let's start to finish this up here. So, uh, yeah, there okay. is still some major... Uh, Roles that freight rail plays in cities in the United States, like this is the garbage, the garbage train, yeah, the garbage. garbage, the garbage, garbage, train. garbage, the cabbage. garbage, fucking yeah, garbage. garbage, yes. You can see the green garbage train here. There's some of the blue garbage train back here. There's also an What's orange garbage train. I don't. Yeah, that one goes to Staten Island. Ah, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, I've I've seen all of them. I, I put was together. thinking it was like separating your recyclables, but on, on scale. It's like the paper and plastic. Like no, glass. There's, there's, yeah, no, there's there's a recycled glass company that sends stuff by rail out of New York. Huh. There is a, a decent number of scrapyards. There's a a lot of construction and demolition debris that comes out of especially Long Island. It's a like getting trash out of New York is a very big business. I think Boston used to have a garbage train, but they don't anymore. They had the incinerator train on Cape Cod. No, we just we mm. we just watched the Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> There's a good story about a Philadelphia garbage barge, which I believe should be an episode at some point. Um, tra- the, the 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 world spanning garbage barge voyage. Um, <laughs> But yeah, this brings New York City's garbage to a landfill in Virginia. Um, mm. For, uh, fresh kills? No, that's too far out. Yeah, and it brings uh, the um, and then it brings oranges back up north. Um, again, do not mix up these trains. Yeah, mm. and then they have they still have a car float operation, you know. And this is how they get the beer into New York City. This is how they get the pizza into New York City. The world's smallest and shittiest aircraft carrier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, every, everything else, like, if you want to get stuff into New York City and you don't want to put it on this barge, which is pretty expensive to operate compared to a normal railroad, you know, yep. you're sending it 240 miles to Selkirk and back. Yeah. And, and build Sel- a bridge! <laughs> Selkirk is fine if you're coming from you the west. Because, you know, you're just coming across the old New York Central main line. And then you're just going south. It's terrible, though, if you're coming from the south, because then you're going all the way up and all the way back down. Yeah, and the other thing is, like, we talked a lot about New York City in this episode, because New York City seems to have the biggest problems. Yeah. But fundamentally, like, most cities in the United States are bringing in all of their shit on trucks. Um, And they just haven't acknowledged that this is a problem yet. That like maybe yeah. they don't need to bring in everything on trucks. It's yeah, you know. <laughs> or if stuff is coming in on on rail, it's like you know, it's a unit grain train to your local like grain pier or coal train to your power plant, or it's or not newsprint to your newspaper that's... printer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not necessarily the stuff that's actually going into like you know directly into the city itself. And a lot of that stuff is now being handled at these distribution centers, which then truck into the city, even if they may themselves be rail served. One interesting thing which is uh, starting to develop is, you know, maybe multi-story industry and distribution centers are coming back, so this is yep. this is being built. This is the South Bronx. Yeah. They can get the cool crane job back. Yes. So this is like, um, you know, it's a multi-story distribution center. You can see they're going to have a rail spur back here. You get a bunch of vans down here in this parking lot. You got this big I'm ramp. I'm curious. I'm curious why in the rental they used flat front, like, cab over engine trucks. Oh. Because... Interesting. To, yeah, very European, very, uh, like, futuristic, and uh, probably uneconomical. It's probably because they just decided to grab whatever they could off of the Google warehouse. Um, mm. Mm. Now, I yeah. will say, interesting thing. Uh, in North Jersey... There was a brief experiment where Scania, a big European truck manufacturer, tried to market trucks in the United States. Most of them were sold in North Jersey, and there are a couple that are still running. 
they're weird because they're like scan they're scanias, but they're not cab overs. They're like regular tractor trailers. Yeah, they built a couple of like um engine Ford ones like and sold them in Europe too. I think it's like a Scania 117 or something. Yeah. Um yeah. I, I saw one once. I was like, I yeah. holy shit, that's a Scania in the United <laughs> States. What the fuck? <laughs> When you mix up your Euro truck and your American truck American simulated truck. DLCs. Yeah. Uh. yeah. This is something they do in Japan a lot, but this will be the first time we see it in the United States. Really what's needed here is just a, a, a big shift in the way we think about freight and freight policy in this country. You know, well, and we this- could stop ordering fucking same day delivery treats. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or or you know, we could we could make rail costs like sort of competitive enough that they would be incentivized to once again deliver that stuff quickly. I mean, you know, you used to be able to order something off the Sears catalog and have it delivered to your local freight station. It wasn't the fastest thing ever, but you know, yeah, you could order a <laughs> rifle and kill the president with that shit, or you could order a whole house. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and kill the president with it. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of it too is that Amazon does do, at least to my knowledge, I don't know if they still do it, but the uh, the like take your time delivery or whatever they call it. Mm-hmm. But I mean, like, I think that that's we're so accustomed to stuff like Amazon Prime, where like if it comes, you know, in more than two days, it's just ah, I can't believe it's taking so long. But perhaps you know. We're gonna have to get back to free shipping on all orders. Some of it just comes, you know, yeah. the wish.com mechanism where it gets there when it gets there. Yeah. You you get the thing three months later when you've forgotten about it. Mm-hmm. And that's a nice treat. Hmm. So you still get the endorphin rush. But the big right. the, the thing is like the railroads don't deliver shit on time. Like they just don't do it. Right. <laughs> maybe they should yeah, do it. Are. What? Just saying, maybe they maybe they yeah. should consider doing that. I think the consensus is if you do PSR right, reliability really does go up. But you know you need to implement it well and not just use PSR as an excuse to, you know, do all the other like rate increases and minimal operations changes that you had been wanting to anyway. It, is this once again a case want- of railroads uh, taking deregulation as an excuse to try to get out of the railroad business? That thing that they do and apparently hate doing. Yes. It's very funny that people get so sentimental about trains when the people who actually, like, at an organizational level are responsible for them seem to fucking despise them. Yeah. Some of that seems to be changing. I mean, at least, you know, Canadian National, for example talks a big talk and to a certain extent has actually done a really you know good job at growing their freight business they i think and now i'm going to start sounding like a some sort of consultant or something they 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 really try to be like logistics providers and integrate it into your supply chain in a real way um by you know really working with ports i mean prince rupert is sort of the classic example of this they supported the development of a sort of a greenfield port in you know the, the northwestern Canadian coast, um, and it's been very successful, and it all goes by rail. And so there are railroads out there that are trying, and there is creativity in the industry. But when you're paying for literally everything you do, and the competition is paying for almost nothing that they do, it's hard. And comp- if you compound that with the general sort of managerial conservatism of railroads and the really poor performance metrics they use, you get a well, you know, a disinvestment mentality. At a lot of railroads. And they pay property taxes. <laughs> yes, lots of them. <laughs> what you got to do is incorporate your railroad as a church. Yes! <laughs> there's Real there's your commercial. solution, yes. Make some heritage units, and then it'll be really a church. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I believe they'll be relic units. <laughs> <laughs> this is the true F9. <laughs> <laughs> You need to, uh, that would probably expand the uh, employee base finally outside of uh, existing, you know, railroad employees and their friends. It's like, well, you can join the, join the church of the Dash Nine. Uh, <laughs> 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 All right. So I guess that's the solution to urban logistics problems is uh, turn the railroad. Railroad into evangelism. A, yeah. Railroad evangelism. Railroad yeah. Evangelism. Uh, 
join join the church. Um, all right. So we have a section in this podcast called Safety Third. Shake hands with danger. But because Matt Iglesias is mad at us online. Yeah, because he <laughs> fucked around, he will now find out. Yes. Uh, in the person of me reading his April 24th, 2013 column after uh, the scene here, Savar uh, factory collapse in Bangladesh, entitled, Different places have different safety rules, and that's okay. And I want to point out, incidentally, that this is top and tailed by an update that's like, see here for further, more appropriate thoughts, and ended with a correction. So, th th this is the true, like, Iglesias quality that we've come to expect. And it's four paragraphs long, I'm gonna blast straight through it. It's very plausible that one reason American workplaces have gotten safer over the decades is that we now tend to outsource a lot of factory explosion risk to places like Bangladesh, where 87 people just died in a building collapse. This kind of consideration leads Eric Loomis, who, as a parenthetical on my part, has now sadly gone insane and, and turned liberal, uh, to the conclusion that we need a unified global standard for safety by which he does not mean that Bangladeshi levels of workplace safety should be implemented in the United States. I think that's wrong. Bangladesh may, may yeah. or may not need tougher workplace safety rules, but it's entirely appropriate for Jesus Bangladesh Christ. to have different and indeed lower workplace safety standards than the United States. Ah! Come on, dude. I think he wrote this like the day after it happened. Too. Well, of course he fucking did. The God. reason is that while having a safe job is good, brains Matt incoming here, money is also good. No, money Jobs. is bad. Money, money is, is bad. bad. We want to get rid of money. That's why we do <laughs> socialism. <laughs> Jobs that well, are that unusually funny. dangerous in the contemporary United States, that's primarily fishing, logging, and trucking, pay a premium over other working class occupations precisely because trucking people are reluctant. Does no, tr trucking does not pay a premium. Trucking does not. Trucking doesn't, we talked about drainage. They, they, there are they're just trucking jobs where you have to pay to work. <laughs> because people are reluctant to risk death or maiming at work. Yes. And in a free why. society, oh, it's good that different people Fuck are off. able to make different choices on the risk reward spectrum. Fuck you. It is man. a good day to die to feed myself. <laughs> <laughs> There are also some good reasons to want to avoid a world of unlimited choice, and see this as a sphere in which collective action is appropriate. But that still leaves us with the question of which collective should make the collective choice. Not one that Matt Iglesias is part of, please. Bangladesh <laughs> is a lot poorer than the United States. Really? And Why? there are very good reasons for Bangladeshi people to make different choices in this regard Fuck you. than Americans. That's true whether you're talking about an individual calculus or a collective calculus. S safety rules that are appropriate for the United States would be unnecessarily immiserating in much poorer Bangladesh. No, God, they wouldn't off. die! They wouldn't have died if the safety rules were there. They would not have died. They would be the alive today. This was like seven years ago. Rules that are appropriate in Bangladesh would be far too flimsy for the richer and more risk-averse United States. Split the difference and you'll get rules that are appropriate for nobody. The current system of letting different countries have different rules is working fine. That's why um, 90 fucking people are dead, Maddie. American <laughs> jobs have Fuck gotten off. much safer over the past 20 years, and Bangladesh has gotten a lot richer. And uh, I, I wanted to read I wanted yeah, to read 
different places have different safety rules and that's okay by friend of the show Matt Iglesias <laughs> because I think it is in a lot of ways uh, sort of the antithesis of everything that we're trying to do on this show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yep. so you might not know the uh, ins and outs of technical uh, uh, federalism, but at least we're not advocating for 90 fucking people to die out of convenience. Yeah, yeah because Lord. it's entirely appropriate for yeah. them to make if, that if, personal if we're the choice. Ones with the moral high ground, you should, you should probably just call it a day, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> I love to make I love to make a personal risk reward <laughs> choice uh, uh, based on like the calculation of Matt Iglesias, a man who has never faced a risk in his fucking life. About to say, yeah. What, what do you think the riskiest job Matt Iglesias has ever had? <laughs> I don't know. Quote tweeting us on Twitter. I no 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 no. He's um he's probably done something riskier than that, but not by much. <laughs> This fucking asshole, man. My god. Uh, Why does he think he can talk to anyone about anything ever again? Because no one's ever told him that he's wrong before. It's the same fucking thing with Barry Weiss, man. Is by the time anyone had sort of been like, no, you're full of shit, they were 29 and owned a house. And and just like buried into the establishment like fucking deer ticks. And like we have this entire class of columnists who we will never be able to get rid of. Just writing fucking four paragraphs about the latest tragedy and being like, well, I don't think we should do more regular I don't understand. You look at a picture like this, of like this crumbled, reinforced concrete, and you're like, yeah, it's probably whatever. Listen, it's entirely appropriate for Bangladesh to have different and indeed lower workplace safety All these standards are in the United 90 States. 90 cents a day as opposed to 50 cents a day. That's progress. <laughs> yeah. Good lord. No, thank you. Has Fuck you, Matt. Has Matt Iglesias ever used power tools? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is a real question. <laughs> Matt Iglesias is a power tool. Also, he signed the letter uh, critical of cancel culture that uh, noted luminary. JK Fuck! Rowling. I wish it was. Oh my god! Get cancelled, yeah, you yeah, fucking fuck piece you, of shit! <laughs> yeah, hi, welcome to well, There's Your Problem, the podcast that goes wildly out of its way to address all the grievances it has. <laughs> yes, that's right. We are a thin-skinned podcast, and yes. I love that about us. <laughs> uh, do not talk to us, Matt Iglesias. <laughs> do not do it. We will remind you of this column that you wrote until the ends of the fucking earth. Society has progressed beyond the need for Matt Iglesias. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, next episode's on the Tacoma Narrows Bridge disaster. That's right. <laughs> um, Let's go make uh, make different choices on the risk reward spectrum. Oh my god! <laughs> bad. Why you need the gender dial so there's no risk? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone got any commercials before we go? Listen to well, listen to Trash Future. Well, thank you. Podcast. Yes. Also, listen to Well, there's your problem. Follow Uday on Twitter. Yes. Uday What's your at Twitter. again? It's oh yeah, like... I'm e three twenty lga. Yeah. There you go. All right. Yeah. All right. I like planes too. In case that wasn't clear. <laughs> <laughs> planes. Oh my god. On this podcast. Yes. Um. <laughs> Follow Matt Iglesias and berate him. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you cannot be banned from Twitter for your comments on here, and so it is not against the tw the YouTube term of service to say, remind Matt Iglesias that he wrote in 2013 that uh, Bangladeshi factory workers being crushed to death were making a, a different choice on the risk-reward spectrum. <laughs> Can we can we put in for this slide uh, the picture of Lore Farquad saying some of you may die, but that is a choice I am willing to make. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, that's a fucking podcast. Yeah, yeah I was about yeah. to say. Um, I just want to say before we go, uh, vote Jess Scarane for Senate September fifteen. If you are in Delaware and you are a registered Democrat. Or maybe it's an open primary. I have no idea. I don't know. Just go oh, to a polling boy. place and start berating Just them until up. you can vote. Yeah. Commit some voter fraud. I don't care. Um, <laughs> do not commit voter fraud. fraud. Yeah. Don't Please voter don't, fraud. don't do not do don't this. Do that. Yeah. Um, and then what else? Uh, so 
I am helping to host a panel uh, in late September for the World Transformed Conference about what a Green New Deal would look like for cities uh, in in Britain, actually. Uh, I don't know why they got me an American for it, but here I am. Uh, we're going to use city skylines to so demonstrate. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to use city skylines to demonstrate how um, you know the Green New Deal may visually affect cities uh, or physically. Uh, we're going to have several speakers there. Um, I will put some details for that in the description. I believe it's September twenty fifth. Um, so. You know, come register. Also, there's other sessions. It's a month long conference, which is already underway. So, you know, if you want to see other sort of general left wing things, you know, you want to sit in for some lectures. Hey, you know, show up. All right. There's your podcast. Yes, we've yep. done it. All right. Can I go to bed now, please? Yes, we 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 made it. I am we now going it. to lie face down yeah. on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go yeah. eat. <laughs> Sounds wise. That may be wise. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thanks for coming on, Ude. No, you're welcome. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I got to talk about some freight trains. Oh, yeah. Bye, I disagree with you guys about housing policy again. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs>